Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah So welcome back to lesson 3 Where we look at the second of our 12 principles Which is ilm, knowledge You cannot do dawah without knowledge You think this is obvious, right? You think it's obvious You cannot do dawah without knowledge But uh, we live in a time where every buddy Has their own YouTube channel Their own blog and people are out there talking absolute nonsense from a position of ignorance. And this is very dangerous. It is extremely dangerous to be doing da'wah without knowledge. I'm not saying you have to be Sheikh islam I'm not saying you have to be the most knowledgeable scholar in the world. I'm simply saying study, learn the religion, know what you're talking about. It doesn't take that long to gain a minimum level of knowledge that is needed to do da'wah right and the main lesson that I want people to learn from this chapter and from this video is that if you are engaged in da'wah you should be a student of knowledge for life you should be studying Islam and you should be dedicated to studying Islam for life it shouldn't be a once-off thing. It shouldn't be, oh, I did a one-year course in Islamic studies. Or, yeah, I did a couple of short online courses. I read a few books. No, it's not like that. Maybe at the beginning, you start like that. But you have to dedicate yourself to lifelong learning. This is necessary. Without this, you are not going to be an effective da'i. In fact, if you remain ignorant... And even worse, if you are ignorant of your own ignorance, meaning you think you know but you don't know, you're not intelligent enough to know that you don't know, and you think you know, you know things, you can cause great harm and damage to the da'wah. Because people who don't know what they are talking about, they will misrepresent the religion, they will misinterpret the religion, they will lead people astray, they will push people away, and we see this almost every day online. Almost every day online, some young kid who has just read one or two books about Islam would start their own channel or their own blog or go on social media and start talking like they are Sheikh al Islam. Right? Like they have the knowledge of all knowledge. Like their opinion is final. Whatever they read in that one book is qat'i. It is definitive knowledge. There's no way somebody else is right and, and that book is wrong. And they will be harsh and they will be fierce and they will be overzealous about this little bit of knowledge that they have. And in the process, they do great harm to the da'wah. And so, if you are going to be doing da'wah, you must do it from a position of ilm, of knowledge. And this means a couple of things. Number one, you should have a minimum level of knowledge before you get involved in da'wah work you should at least have some knowledge of the fundamentals before you get involved in da'wah work number two you should have a systematic way to study islam over your entire lifetime and number three it means that when you talk you only talk from a position of knowledge and you are humble enough that if you are asked a question and you don't know the answer, you simply reply, I do not know. Many people can't do this, right? Many years ago, one of my friends joined a Dawa organization, very prestigious Dawa organization. And he came to me for advice. He was looking perplexed. So I asked him what happened. He said the, the du'at at that organization told him that you should never say, I don't know. Always have an answer. He says, what if I genuinely don't know? They said, make something up. Muslims must look intelligent. We mustn't look like we don't know. I told him, this is terrible advice. If you make something up, you're literally changing Allah's religion. That's terrible advice. What kind of a da'i tells other du'at to speak without knowledge? Anyway, that, that organization didn't last very long. Maybe that's a good thing. If that was the approach. 
But just think about this. Do art giving such terrible advice to speak always even if you don't know? While this contradicts the actual teachings of Islam. The great scholar Ashabi Rahimullah said, the statement I do not know is one half of knowledge. Half of knowledge is saying I don't know. Right? We have many stories of this in the past. Of a man traveling all the way from North Africa to Medina to ask Imam Malik questions. And to more than half of the questions, Imam Malik just replied, I don't know. And he said, I traveled all this way. What am I going to tell my people? And then Imam Malik told him, tell your people Malik doesn't know. Tell him I don't know. Like, you don't have to know everything. Right? You need to be humble. Muslims, especially Muslims involved in da'wah, need to be humble. We don't know sometimes. And it's okay to admit you don't know. Now some people may say, but if I'm doing da'wah to a non-Muslim and he asks me a question and I say I don't know, this will look bad. Well, not necessarily. So for example, let's, let's do a case study here. Just say you're a young person, right? It's your first year of doing da'wah. So you go out there, you're like all zealous, excited. You start talking to a non-Muslim about Islam and he brings up an issue you haven't studied. And he, for example, maybe he'll tell you, uh, Islam allows child marriages. What do you have to say about that? And you've never researched the issue. Now, a lot of people today, under pressure, feeling like they always need to have something to say, they will just make something up. They will just make something up. And I can guarantee you on this topic, because this topic is so nuanced and so... Uh, it, it requires a lot of knowledge to understand the Islamic position, why it is the way it is, and uh, what are the actual details of it. So a lot of people, if they're going to talk on this without knowledge, they are going to say things that are wrong. No matter what the answer is, it's most likely going to be wrong. Likewise, they may tell you like, Islam has a concept of offensive jihad. Right? And then you will get those guys who say, no, no, Islam is peace, we only defend ourselves. Well, guess what? You, you're changing the religion here. Right? And some people generally don't know about the concept of uh, jihad of expansion, which is an, an, a part of our religion. It's something that's Again, there's actually very logical explanations for why these things are part of our religion. But many people just don't know. They simply do not have the knowledge to answer the question properly. So whatever you say is going to be wrong. And you're going to give that person misinformation. So the right thing to do is if someone raises a question with you, you should look at them and say, I don't know about that. I haven't studied that. Let me research and get back to you. You see, this is a very honest and humble way of doing things. And this is the, the way of Islam. This is the Islamic way. You don't have to win every argument. You don't have to appear to be super knowledgeable all the time. It is fine, even when dealing with non-Muslims, to say, I haven't researched this, I haven't studied this. Let me do my research and I'll get back to you with an answer. It's fine to say that. Right? And honestly, if they are sincere, they will appreciate you for that. And if they are not sincere, who cares what they think of you? So, this is very important that we do not speak without knowledge. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, he, makes a, he has a list in the Quran of things that are haram, which include fahisha and sin. And in the end of that list, and that you say about Allah that which you do not know. Speaking about Allah's religion without knowledge is a major sin. Right? In other words, Allah says, do not occupy yourself with that which you have no knowledge of. And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever speaks about the Quran without knowledge, let him take his seat in the hellfire. And even in the verse of Dawah, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us? Qul hazihi sabili ad'u ilallahi ala al Say, this is my way. I invite to Allah with clear knowledge. I invite to Allah Allah al-Basira with clear knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in the Quran, when he talks about da'wah, he talks about knowledge. He says, you should call to Islam with clear knowledge. Meaning, if you are not clear about a topic, say, I do not know. And then go and do your research. Don't just sit there and don't know for life. Go and do your research. I can guarantee you, whatever the question is, there's an answer out there for it. This is Allah's religion. 
and Allah's religion is the true religion and the true religion there is always proofs there's always evidence there's always an argument that you can find to explain why it is the way it is but you have to do the research and that means you have to seek knowledge and you should never in your life reach a point where you think I know it all I've done enough I've studied enough I know enough I'm just going to do that one now a Muslim should never reach a point in their life where they think that they are done they don't need to study any further no if if you are doing dawah you should be a student of knowledge for life because really there is so much of ilm and knowledge out there it's never ending it is literally never ending you can read islamic books for the rest of your life and there'll always be something new for you to learn that is the depth of our religion which is part of the miracle of islam part of the miracle of islam is how deep it is that this knowledge is never ending the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every muslim so if seeking knowledge and this hadith in general means seeking knowledge that you need to practice islam if that is an obligation upon every muslim then if you are involved in dawah then seeking knowledge that facilitates your dawah is also an obligation upon you and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the believer is never satisfied with learning that which is beneficial until he arrives in paradise meaning the believer is always seeking beneficial knowledge the entire life a muslim is a student for life always seeking more and more beneficial knowledge that journey only ends when we get to paradise and imam malik rahimahullah said it is not befitting for anyone with knowledge to give up studying imam malik said this it is not befitting for anyone with knowledge to give up studying meaning when you choose to study islam and to teach islam and to preach islam you are making a commitment to be a student for life and in my own lifetime i've noticed the difference between those who've committed to being a student for life and those who just do the bare minimum and then stop and at a very young age i remember my teachers telling me that what we are teaching you is the bare minimum you need to keep studying for the rest of your life but unfortunately most of the people who i know who started studying islam at some point usually after graduation they close their books and they never study again and within a decade or two they they become irrelevant to the society because they haven't been sharpening their mind they haven't been improving their skills improving their knowledge they just stayed at one level for life and that's not a good thing especially if you're doing dawah especially if you are involved in islamic work you have to keep sharpening your mind by by learning more and more and more so at the very minimum i would advise people who are doing dawah to at least begin with some kind of one year foundations of islamic studies type of course just learn the basics and a dawah training course right do the foundations of islamic studies and a dawah training course whoever you do it with that's up to you there are many of these courses available online and in many communities around the world but at least start with that if you are serious about growing your knowledge to a scholarly level then commit to at least 4 years of formal islamic studies at least a bachelor's of islamic studies but don't stop there don't stop there you should do at least if you really want to be scholarly try to get in at least 10 years of formal study and then remain a student on the side for life now again in in my case i i'm trying my best to do this as well and none of us are perfect but i do try to do this i started studying islam when i was 13 and i did 7 year alimiya program then i studied with a western university for a while and then i studied in a islamic university for 4 years so 7 or 12 years right of formal study but besides that i have made sure that every year i am studying online courses i'm st- studying with local shuyukh i'm reading books i'm listening to podcasts i'm doing whatever i can to learn more so one of the habits that i've developed and that i try 
to encourage all of my students to develop as well is the habit of reading a lot of books. See, I discovered about a, a decade ago that if you can read like 50 books a year, that is the equivalent of researching for a full PhD every year. So I have committed to reading 60 books a year. And I've been doing that for many years now, alhamdulillah. And I found this to be very beneficial because it forces me to read every single day. It forces me to look for new books, to end up discovering some amazing gems that other people aren't reading, uh, which are full of beneficial knowledge. It makes sure I'm always increasing my knowledge every single year. And not just this, but reading itself I have noticed when I've studied the biographies of successful people, and success, I mean both Dean or Dunya type of success, one quality they all have in common is that they read a lot. They read a lot. You know, if you look back at the biography of Ahmad rahimahullah, he didn't even finish high school. He had no university qualifications. But he had one habit that changed his life. He loved to read. And he used to work in a supermarket and he discovered in the owner's, uh, I think it was in the basement or something, some Islamic books on comparative religion. So when the shop was quiet, he would sit and read those books. And that's where he started. That's where his knowledge started from. And he just read and he read and he read and he grew into the man that he grew into. If you look at Malcolm X, when he was in prison, you know, what's, the, what's, what's the picture you get of him when you think of Malcolm X in prison? You imagine him sitting in the library and reading. Because really, it was reading books. I mean, the man read the entire dictionary, right? Uh, it's reading books that not only shaped his knowledge, but even the eloquence with which he spoke. So this is something that, that again, in our times, a lot of people don't read. And, you know, on that point, you know, I love to write books. That's my, my, my passion. And a lot of times when I write books, people tell me things like, oh, but people don't read anymore. Who are you writing for? Well, firstly, I don't really believe that people don't read anymore because almost every day somebody messages me to say they read one of my books and they benefited from it. Number two, I want to change this culture. I believe if we produce books worth reading, more people will start reading. But number three, to an extent they are right. You know, people used to tell me, that if you focus on online courses and videos instead of books, more people would benefit from you. And I realized this, like if I have a book on a topic and I have an online course on the same topic, more people end up doing the online course, right? Because nowadays we tend to learn more from listening to somebody speak than reading a book. And that's why I decided to, to package these together, to have the videos and the book. So even people who don't usually read a book, maybe they'll read it if there's videos attached to it. But really, this needs to change. If we want to be a great ummah once again, we have to revive the culture of reading. This is why I read a lot. This is why I write a lot. This is why I speak about reading a lot. This is why I speak about writing a lot. This is why I speak about books so much. Because books are our legacy. As Muslims, books are our legacy. Think about Islam. Think about the history of Islam. You think about, you got Sahih al-Bukhari, we got the, you know, the works of an nawawi we've got the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, or Imam Ghazali. What are these? These are books. Books are our legacy. Our whole religion is built upon books. Allah's final revelation came in the form of a book. The Quran is a book that contains Kalamullah, the words of Allah. This shows how important books and reading are in Islam. So as Muslims, we must have a habit of reading. And this is something I'm going to preach and preach and preach, whether people listen to me or not. I really hope that we see a revival of reading and a, and, and a beneficial reading culture amongst Muslims in our lifetime, because I really believe this is the one habit that if you can keep this up for life, you will be a student for life. If you can always be reading new books, and deeper books and more complicated books with each passing year, then your knowledge and your thinking skills and your creativity are going to get stronger and stronger with each passing year. And you could reach a level of knowledge that is 
on a completely, you know, that, that, that's like completely beyond your imagination if you keep up with this habit. So read, read a lot. And don't just read within your field. You know, I know most of us want to specialize in one field, so maybe it's comparative religion, maybe it's philosophy, maybe it's dawah techniques, maybe it's dealing with atheists, maybe it's fiqh, maybe it's stuff. See, if someone chooses a field, they specialize in it, that's fine, that's good, but read outside of your field as well. Right? This helps you to think more broadly. This helps you to see things from different perspectives. So make sure that you, that you read broadly. So like if you're reading 50 books a year and you specialize in comparative religion, maybe read 25 comparative religion books, 5 tafsir books, 5 hadith books, 5 fit books, 5 psychology books, 5 business books, something like this, so that you hone in on that field that you're specializing in, but you also diversify your ability to think about other things outside of your field and to talk about them uh, productively, right? So make sure that you do this. So reading is a very important skill for every one involved in the da'wah. We should read a lot. Other things you could do is attend classes outside of uh, your regular classes. So your regular classes would stop at some point, right? If you're going for to do a bachelor's in Islamic studies or a foundations of Islamic studies program, after a couple of years, it's going to be over. But like, if you know of a scholar in your community who has deep knowledge, try to have access to that scholar regularly. Even if it's a one-on-one -on -one class, even if it's just five people and their teacher once a week. But that regular access to a person of knowledge that is something that is a gold mine for you. That is something that can really make a huge difference in your life. And if you don't have people like that in your community, Alhamdulillah, we live in the age of the internet. They are online courses, right? They are video series just like this one by much more intelligent and knowledgeable people than myself that you can be studying with. Take advantage of that. Learn from them. Spend time with them. Try to develop these habits and to stick to these habits for life because this is what's going to make you exceptional. This is what's going to take you to the next level. And also this is what's going to protect you from saying the wrong thing. Be very wary of speaking without knowledge. When you speak without knowledge, you are changing Allah's religion. You are giving people wrong information. Someone may convert to Islam based on wrong information. Later on they realize that you told them a lie that you misrepresented the religion and they may end up apostating because of you. I believe it is better that people have an honest, clear picture of what Islam is and what Islam teaches and that they accept that and they submit to that wholeheartedly than for them to have a distorted view of Islam based on somebody's half knowledge. And We'll talk about this more when we come to the importance of courage and honesty in the dawah. But let's just talk a little bit about it now. A lot of people, when they do dawah, they, you know, when it comes to the controversial topics, they try to make Islam fit into the Western worldview, right? So they try to make Islam seem like it's feminist or it's liberal or it's, uh, you know, it's humanist. In reality, Islam is its own thing. Islam is its own thing. It has its own worldview. It, it has its own way of, of, of dealing with these uh, controversial topics. And it approaches them from very different angles from these other philosophies. You cannot make Islam fit into other philosophies. Rather, you can get people who have other ways of thinking to understand the Islamic worldview. So instead of trying to justify to a non-Muslim why this is haram or this is halal or this is obligatory in Islam, you rather get them to understand how the Muslims view the world, right? The Muslims look at things from the perspective of Allah created us, He knows what is best for us, and He sent us the prophets and the message, and He knows what is right and what is wrong, and our job is to follow that, right? This is the Muslim worldview. And of course, what Allah wants us to do may be very different from what we want to do. And that we may think something is good for us, but Allah in His infinite wisdom knows that it's bad for us. And therefore, he has prohibited it. You see, this is, this is the Islamic way of looking at the life, at looking at the world. And too many du'at are not skilled at explaining this. So they waste a lot of time in trying to rationally prove 
uh, why Islam's positions are the way they are, but they do it from a perspective that is incompatible with Islam. Instead, you need to learn how to present the Islamic worldview properly, and this, of course, is done with knowledge, so you need to seek that knowledge, and the more you seek that knowledge, the more eloquent you will become at explaining this, and the more easy it will be to explain this. For every controversial question about Islam, there is knowledge you can seek that can help you to answer it appropriately. Anything. Right? Just look at a few examples. Uh, the issue of why does Islam allow a man to be intimate with his slave girl? Right? This is a controversial point that the non-Muslims keep bringing up. Right? And there's many ways you could approach this. Firstly, it's not just Islam. Technically, every religion allows it. We just don't have slavery today. But if you're honest about it, every religion allows it. Right? Number two, Islam allows it because it fits within the framework of a family. Right? The Islamic family is the man is the leader, the provider, and the protector. The woman lives with him, and she has children, and the children know who their mother is, they know who their father is, they have access to their mother, they have access to their father, and the mother focuses on raising those children. Well, guess what? Marriage has this structure, but so does slavery. It also has this structure. And so both of these type of relationships are seen as legitimate relationships in the sight of Allah. Right? That's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. And I know this answer won't satisfy everyone. But guess what? You can't satisfy everyone. At the end of the day, our religion is the way it is. It is what Allah knows what is best in terms of what is moral and what is immoral. And the most you can do is explain the Islamic position. And it's up to them whether they want to accept it or not. Sometimes it takes them a long time to accept it because they are so uh, restricted by their worldview. Right? So people growing up in the West, to them... Because of their worldview and their history, slavery is something evil and unacceptable. But their history of slavery is radically different from the Muslim history of slavery. And as long as you are unable to show them that, they are looking at all slavery as the American slavery. Right? That's the other perspective you have to go into. That in the Islamic world, men treated the, the, their slave woman very well. They treated them almost like wives. Like they fed them from what they ate, they clothed them from what they wear, they didn't overwork them, they were loving, they were romantic, they had really good relationships with their, with, with their slave woman. It wasn't what they are imagining. You know, they imagine someone in handcuffs and chains being whooped. That wasn't the Islamic way. In the Islamic state, if a man beat up his, his slave, the slave could take him to court and if, if, they, if they can prove that they were abused, then the judge can dis, can force the man to free that slave. Right? In the Islamic world, slaves had rights. They could actually take their owners to court. It's a very different world, a very different history. And again, their worldview is based on their history. That's why you need to study their history as well. That's why you need to learn about their philosophies, their histories, their worldviews, and how to counter all of that from the Islamic perspective. All of this is knowledge. All of this is knowledge. And knowledge is not restricted to just Quran and Sunnah. No, you need to know the history of the other religions and worldviews and movements. You need to know their philosophies. You need to know how they look at the world, how they think about the world. Because you have to understand someone in order to reach out and to pull them back to the straight path. If you don't understand how somebody got to where they are, then you're not going to be able to bring them back to where you are. Because you're now talking two different languages. They are processing knowledge in one way, you are processing it in a completely different way, and you are not understanding each other. So you need knowledge, not just knowledge of Quran and Sunnah, but also knowledge of how other people think, and why they think the way they think, and how to deal with the way they think. So knowledge is central to Dawah, and you cannot do Dawah without knowledge. I want to end with just some practical tips on how to excel at seeking knowledge. When it comes to seeking knowledge, I have noticed throughout my life three types of students. The lazy ones, the ones who just learn the bare minimum and forget it afterwards, and somehow they become teachers and that's very dangerous for society. Then you have the average students. They learn what their teachers teach them, they pass their exams, they're competent at doing basic things, right, to that knowledge. But as you will see with our next principle, which is Ihsan, we shouldn't aim for, to be average, we should aim for excellence. 
So how do you excel? How do you go above and beyond and become a truly excellent student of knowledge and in the process, a truly excellent da'i? Number one, study longer hours than everybody else. If you notice the average student is, is studying two hours a day, you should study five hours a day. Study more than everybody else. Number two, ask questions. The Prophet wasallam said, the cure to ignorance is to ask questions. If you look at Aisha anha and Abu Huraira and many of the great scholars of, of the Sahaba, they asked a lot of questions. And many of the ahadith that we know come from the questions that they asked. So ask your teachers questions. This is where a lot of the knowledge comes from, the Q&A. Number three, go beyond the textbook. Go beyond the textbook. If you are studying a subject and the teacher gives you one textbook on that subject, seek out the top five or ten books on that subject and read all of them. So if everybody else in your class has read one book on that topic and you read ten books on that topic, inshallah you'll have more knowledge in them. And by the way, this isn't to show off or anything. This is just ihsan. This is just trying to do your best and to know the subject best. Right? This is why you do it, not so you can show off to the other students. So, if you really want to go deeper into a subject, there are many books on every subject. Too many people just limit themselves to the primer, to the first textbook that they are given on that topic, and they never study anything beyond that. If you really want to master a topic, you're going to read 20, 30, 40 books on that topic. And that will put you on a level way above those who just read one. Number four, attend classes outside of your core classes. So, yes, you may be doing a Foundations of Islamic Studies program. You may be doing a Bachelor's in Islamic st Studies. You may be studying the Alimiya program, right? And by the way, uh, I'm hoping to release another video in the near future where I compare the three strands of study that I did. I did seven years of the Alimiya program, one year in a Western University, which I was not happy with, and then four years with the Islamic University. I'd actually like to compare all three experiences and give students of knowledge advice on what's the best way forward uh, for studying Islam based on my experience. Inshallah, that will be another video for the future. Uh, but the point I'm getting to is that don't limit yourself to those classes. Attend other classes outside of it as well. So maybe you are studying, but you notice that your teachers aren't teaching you few subjects so maybe maqasid sharia is missing from the curriculum or islamic history is missing from the curriculum or psychology is missing from the curriculum attend classes on those subjects outside on the side so that you're not just learning what you're learning from your core curriculum but you're learning even more on the side so find other teachers to teach you those subjects finally if you really want to be extraordinary at, at seeking knowledge then make sure that you are committed to studying for life which is really the main point that i was getting to today be a student of knowledge for life if you are truly serious about doing da'wah and remember that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever allah intends good for he gives them the understanding of this religion so therefore if allah is giving you knowledge if allah is opening the doors for you to seek knowledge then this is a sign that allah loves you the sign that Allah intends good for you and so you should take advantage of that and study the religion and use that knowledge in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We end by saying that every caller must commit to studying for life. A preacher who is lazy in seeking knowledge will cause more harm than good. He may preach nonsense in his ignorance and chase people away from the religion. And he may be so ignorant of his own ignorance that he doesn't even realize what he is doing. An ignorant preacher is a dawah hazard and should be advised to seek knowledge. If they refuse to seek knowledge and if they are arrogant and self-deluded, then they should be avoided. Why? Because in their ignorance and in their ignorant dawah, they will drag you down with them. They will preach nonsense and they will drag you down to their level and when, when things fall apart, anyone involved in supporting an ignorant da'i will also face the consequence of supporting ignorance. So make sure that you are a student of knowledge for life, that you're not lazy about seeking knowledge, and that the people you work with are also studying Islam for life. And avoid working with people who think they know, 
but they don't know because they will end up causing more harm to the dawa and in the process they will end up causing harm to you as well because they don't know that they don't know with that we come to the end of the session hope you found it beneficial in our next video we will discuss the concept of ihsan striving for excellence jazakallah khairan wa akhir dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh